there are very few people who started signing up for sebi itself and only the people who signed up on later are able to even come up from this otherwise they had to work with somebody and they went through that 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 mindset right so in today india yeah there are about a thousand i guess uh, ra is registered but majority of them are still somehow you know although they are not supposed to they still you know earn commissions or through ancillary uh, associations and all that but very few people who are fee based but even the fee based are trying to sell products and then fee only is just a handful as you as we may have seen about 20 25 30 of us uh, so that's the challenge and it, to to make the things to make things worse sebi has made it so difficult unfortunately for new entrants to come in and even a person exactly. i have so many people in this foi to you know support others and become get, get this um, uh, this tribe growing but they're not able to enter because of the regulations you need 5 years of experience and uh, we're net worths and all this kind of fun, uh, you know this and it has to be full time yeah and has to be full time exactly so yeah. and that's the result the result of that is that it's just a handful of us in india who do this uh, advisory 20 and odd did you have an exact number yeah and, uh, if you go to the fee only india website there's literally about 23 i think right now as we speak uh, who are pure fee only there may be others who have not reached out to join us maybe but uh, just a hand maybe you can count with your hand the other this is amazing this is fascinating you guys are a rare breed so this is that episode we've been slowly building up to right for the last few episodes but when i've been discussing about if you started investing what happens next what are the different theories of rebalancing de-risking uh, we showed you proof that rebalancing and de-risking works we gave you some calculators to figure out your financial situation in this current day and age and then we laid it all out for you very carefully about what the professional financial advice landscape looks like and we are very pleased finally to introduce you to vikram krishna murthy from insightful.in but the introduction is going to be done by pattu pattu i'm so delighted that you've brought brought us to this stage thank you and and welcome to yet another episode of let's get rich with pattu yeah hi uh, so i i'm delighted to have vikram on board and um Are delighted that we are talking about fee only advisory again because not much has been said about it uh, out there. So uh, last week we talked about the different players in the uh, market, uh, the professionals, different kind of people, and the kind of conflicts of interest they have, and uh, we we honed in on this flat fee fee only advisors, SEBI registered investment advisors, and we talked about uh, my list. Uh, I have a curated list that's slightly older than the SEBI regulations, investment advisory regulations. Slightly old before 2013, I started it, and then we talked about Fee Only India, which is an informal association of uh, such advisors. So uh, I was on the lookout very badly for such advisors who who don't sell anything, you know, no commissions, and uh, I was extremely disappointed because people used to mock at me, saying, "How is this even possible?" so i was doing this uh, mid 2012 right and uh, i mean it was very very uh, disappointing to i was getting one or two names uh, at best and then finally it came to about 5 6 and at that time vikram wrote to me saying that um, i know i've just started my uh, advisory in india i've got my uh, sebi ra uh, license and uh, if it's okay for maybe you can consider adding me to your list and so i i went to insightful.in and that was an amazing experience for me i have never seen at that point that was probably the best advisors website i had ever seen even today it's among the top 3 or top 5 advisor websites because it's so simple neat it tells the person who you know who's visiting what the service is all about what is it uh, uh, vikram is going to do and uh what you what you can expect from the whole process so uh so that's when i uh i got to know vikram and we have interacted in these uh, fee only india uh, meets that we have from time to time either online or uh, in person and so on and uh there are two things that astound me about vikram maybe more than two things one is that when he started out in india he had basically no financial roots in india am i right uh, vikram is that right, right to say right. yeah there's no financial roots i mean of course it's his yeah home coimbatore is his hometown and so on but he had no financial roots he was practicing financial planning in canada and he came here uh, at the time sebi investment advisory regulations came in many people in the financial industry were opposing it 
but oh. for somebody like vikram it was probably the right thing at the happen you know uh, it was perfect for him so he got the uh, uh, his uh, license and he's one of the first he probably the top 250 sebi rias in india if i'm not wrong right and uh, so uh, and he is uh, able to attract clients primarily i would say because of the his clarity the clarity in his website the clarity in the way in which he speaks to clients and he doesn't uh, uh, tweet every day or every month or even every he doesn't he never tweets he never he's not on social media at all uh, with respect to his clients he's not on social media at all and he doesn't produce any kind of content in his blogs uh, in his website he the blogs uh, he has written are mostly for me i have asked him to write it and he has written it yet he gets a steady stream of clients it is truly extraordinary i mean i'm not saying it will work for everybody but vikram is exceptional in it and uh, we have this surveys that uh, of clients that we do and vikram has got excellent feedback from many of his clients and uh, in the show you have always been interested about freelancing right we, uh, money management yes. for freelancers that's something they often neglect because i am salaried i tend to look at everybody else's salaried and uh, it's a big question in my list what to yeah so uh, i think vikram is an exceptional inspiration for solopreneurs one person companies freelancers yes. whatever Music you whatever you want to call it because he has set it all up by himself he is extremely meticulous when it comes to analytics the kind of uh, efforts that he's doing per client that the the man hours spent per client everything is charted out uh, and you know it's he's his organization skills are amazing so he's uh, not only is he a, a, a good adv uh, advisor to clients i mean he's a good fit for anybody who is looking for sound professional advice he's also such an inspiration for people who are you know trying to build their own business and i have asked vikram to write about this i think you have written about uh, in one article about how to uh, you know build this kind of uh, one person company kind of thing and so uh, that's what i have to say about vikram and i look forward to hearing from him. Vikram, are you used to getting yeah. so much praise? Well, <laughs> I don't know where to start, but but to you know, uh, th this is beyond kind words. But uh, thank you so much for the introduction, and I uh, really appreciate what you've done for us and for me especially too. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I think you've covered all the main, of course, what I do. But uh, I guess I'll just give a brief background about where I came from and what I do. Uh, as Patu said, I was in Canada. I was working there as a financial planner. And even before that, I actually started, uh, you know, uh, I, I was doing my MBA in India. And that's when I came across this wealth management concept. And at that stage in 2006, we didn't have much that concept in India. Even if it was, it was just through these big banks. We're just trying to push products to these high net worth individuals. So I was intrigued and I wanted to learn more. And that's why I went to do a one-year course. I got this opportunity to go do a one-year course in financial planning in Canada. And then I came back, uh, back in 2014. Uh, after I worked there for about seven, eight years. And it was very clear as Patu said, I wanted to do this the right way in the sense that I wanted to do as a fee-only kind of practice. And luckily, as Patu also said, SEBI just came out with those regulations to, you know, give that validation that, you know, this is the, um, the license in need. And also Patu was kind enough to add, him, add me to the list and all that. So my whole journey started from there. But yeah, my whole uh, career has been around financial planning and you no. Know, Thanks, uh, Patu, to, you know, uh, giving me that uh, background and that, uh, you know, that uh, validation too. Thank you. Yeah. Vikram, if you don't mind, let's dial back a few years. Um, yeah. You say you were doing your MBA, like That's right. hundreds of thousands of, uh, you know, postgraduates here in India try to do. And MBA is a very key career option. But then your next step is extremely rare, right? What brought that into your mind of doing wealth management? Yeah. You know, when we were chatting the other day in preparation for this episode, I didn't even know there was such a course back in the day yeah. in Canada. Of course, is there such course uh, now in India at all? And what made you take that route? Sure, sure. So as I was saying, when I was doing my MBA, we had just, just this one week program on wealth management, just an introduction to what wealth management is and things like that. Uh, but even then, it was more about, you know, how to deal with people's money and uh, how to mostly, you know, push products. And that's the kind of approach I was getting out of it. Uh, but I was interested. I was interested in personal finance because my own history of my family having struggles with personal finance has always mm. driven me to, you know, that, uh, that, that interest in, you know, how to deal with money better, right? 
So I wanted to really specialize in that one specific thing and uh, grow my career in that. But as I said, at that stage in India, there was no education. There was, I think, CFP just started then, but the experience and nothing was there. So in the advanced countries like Canada, they have been through that cycle for about 10, 15, 20 years. So they know what is going on. They had these courses specifically, a postgrad in financial planning itself. And it was tied to the CFP program there. So if you pass that and write a couple of more exams, you can get the CFP itself there. So yeah, that drove me to go there. But yeah, I've always had that uh, interest in personal finance and that's such what kept me going into and deeper and deeper into that uh, that field. Yeah. And a little bit about that timing in 2014 when you decided yeah. to come back to India. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about that time in your life and how the, the rules changed as Patu was saying, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, your slight sure. journey in 2014 that started sure. you off. Sure. So yeah, I was working there. I I was happy with my job and everything. Initially, I started working with banks. And there again, even though I had my CFP there, uh, you're just a glorified salesman. You're just trying to so-called create a plan. But end of the day, you're judged by the number of products you sell or all that kind of stuff, right? So I I did well in the job, but never enjoyed or never felt right about it. And uh, my last job there was actually with the pension board, the government pension board, where they give advice to uh, retirees. Uh, and there, there's nothing to sell as a government. There's nothing to sell, right? So I really enjoyed that job, the last two years of me working there. But as a family, we were growing. I had my first son there. And uh, when we were starting school, we always wanted to come back to India and settle down. That was always our plan. So yeah, we came back in 2014 for that specific reason. But when I came back, I was very clear that if I want to do something in India, it has to be on my terms, not working for another person, you know, trying to sell products. And I wanted to do this right way. I had no idea how it's going to plan out or or what. I didn't even know there was this SEBI license that came out and all that, but I wanted to do this. And luckily, it was just the timing was right that the SEBI also came out with that, um, you know, the license program and all that. And, And it just worked out from there. Again, even when I started, I had no idea I would be where I am today or anything. Even Patu, I'm sure, didn't know how far this would go. But it was a very new, and even today, it's barely scratching the surface. At that time, it was almost nothing, zero. You had to educate client what financial planning is. Today, it's not the case. People understand what financial planning is and then reach out to you. So that's a huge difference. But having said that, up until I perhaps started thinking about this show, thanks to Rajesh on our team, um, I always assumed, for whatever reason, that this was only for rich people right? Uh, I'd done a finance show back in the day, I would say, even if you go back four or five years. And even then, when I was speaking to these experts, they said, you know, huh, minimum ticket size, you know, that was the words they use, minimum yeah. ticket size, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I had no idea that somebody even starting out, which is a large mm-hmm. portion of our viewers and listeners, can actually take your service. Uh, if they can, of course, uh, afford you or think there is value to it, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll get to that separate discussion. Um, but this is very eye-opening for a number of people that I speak to as well. So how would you start to describe what it is you do uh, sure. for people who have are well into their investment journey and for newbies? Sure. So the first point you mentioned is people have this assumption that it's only for rich people, right? I actually tell the opposite. Rich people can afford not to have a plan. They can, you know, exactly. somehow make it. <laughs> people who yeah. don't have enough or just about to get somewhere in life, they need to have efficiencies in what they're doing and get there and much more optimally, right? And that's where you need to have a clear roadmap and a clear plan. So yeah, first of all, it has nothing to do with the amount of money, and even including my service, right? I never sell or uh, talk about my service in terms of how much money a person has or what their income is. I have cl- clients who just students out of college, they come and get a job, get their first job and come and do a plan with me, not because they have a lot of money, because they want to get that long-term clarity and structure earlier and early on in life. So it absolutely, that's a misconception that I think things are changing now. People are understanding that now, but it's still a long way to go. Um, but yeah, that's the value. But There are, see, typically there are two types of people who come to a financial planner, at least like me. One is complete newbies who have no idea. They heard that there is somebody who can help them with that and they come and they get start from scratch. They get educated in that process and go. Majority of my clients, at least each financial planner is different. Majority of my clients are DIY kind of investors who with help of like like Patu's blogs, right? They have all the information that we need to build a proper, absolutely great plan. They come to me not because they don't know stuff, not because you can't go and Google and find out. They come because they want to have a third person, a professional, look at it from an outside point of view Mm. and validate and ask them questions and bring a better structure around their finances, right? That's the real value. It's also these emotions, right? See, when we deal with personal finance, there are two uh, challenges. One is the emotions that we have when we deal with our own money and the biases that come in, right? So the emotion part, yeah, see, let's say you want to buy a car or a house. 
you can do all the math you want but end of the day you have emotions that you really want it i have zero emotion towards your life i would look at it objectively and give you that viewpoint you can yeah. still go ahead with the decision of buying that even if it does not make financial sense but as long as i've you know made you understand the impact of that fi- emotional decision i've done my job right so people come as diy investors even though they've done a great plan for themselves to get that validation and that uh, structuring and that uh, the peace of mind knowing that it's been validated by another person right that's the real value for most DIY investors who come and uh, reach out to me yeah it's fascinating you know when i was thinking about this episode as well and and patu you can come in here as well we need professionals in our lives for so many things you know when we're unwell we go to a doctor when we have legal trouble we go to a lawyer you st- vikram are straddling a very interesting space because i feel this entire world of financial planning and money is not just nuts and bolts you know it's a very emotional thing you ask a number of people there's a very famous question that goes around right if you had all the money in the world or if you don't need if you don't need to work another day in your life what would you do and here these dreams are now being quantified and given structure and a path by people like yourself which is perhaps the final frontier of life you know uh you can now start thinking about look i have a road map it's going to take 20 years 25 years etc etc but then i need to start thinking about what next because vikram's going to i'm not going to use the word guarantee but going to you know put me on a path that i can start thinking about that phase of life which is which is fascinating for me um so do you see a lot of emotion since you said you take the emotion out of it do you see a lot of emotion in the process when you deal with your clients Yeah so it, it absolutely see because when we deal with personal finance it is personal right so it's a lot of things like you know buying a car or house you can convince them any way you want in, in, see i can prove to you why buying a car doesn't make sense today by taking uber every day is the cheapest way you can live but i myself own a car so everybody has those emotions that come into that you know decision making but again my job is not to convince them that no you're wrong it's not about that at all it's to make sure they understand the impact that uh, you know the cause and effect of that decision on their long term plan so you buying this car today is going to push back your financial freedom by 3 years or 5 years if you understand that then you're at least making a fully informed decision and if you understand that then i've done my job right so it's perfectly fine to go against what i'm doing but it is important for you to understand the impact so emotions are always going to be there uh, but it's understanding the impact of the decision that emotion is what is really really important yeah on the previous episode uh, vikram patu said a very interesting thing that uh, financial planners such as yourself reject a lot of clients uh, for me that was really and why is that how is that what is that entire world yeah, like so, yeah i i wouldn't say I, i put myself higher if i say reject it's not about rejecting it's more about the, like just in any service right there is always going to be a core value in what you do or the style in which you do or the core value of what you provide right. it may not match with what the clients are looking for right just in any other service out there so yeah uh, when that mismatch is there it's better we don't take on the client it's not about money right if had, money was the thing i would be selling products and you know um, earning commissions and things like that when you want to really enjoy what you're doing you want to have the right relationship with that client and you want to really uh, be uh, you know in the right mindset when you're even helping that client so for that reason you may find mismatches and there are there are the, those are the places where i would be honest with the client and say okay there's there seems to be some mismatch in what you're looking for or even our attitudes sometimes don't match so yeah that's the situation but most people who go through the structure of understanding what i do and then reach out to me have already pre-validated they understand what i do and what i don't do also some people who randomly somebody refer somebody and they call me that's when you see there's a lot of mismatch so but yeah there are times when we have to you know uh, say that this may not work and uh, that's that's the point if i may uh, here sure. uh, sorry uh, so uh, you talked about the uh, experience with a lawyer with a ca a doctor and so on the big difference between those professionals and uh, a financial planner is that uh, in the case of a financial planner the results are not immediate you're yeah. not going to immediately win a case get cured of something you know that's not going to or file your tax return that's not going to happen here right so only people who can appreciate the structure uh, in the financial plan only they can be good clients so like vikram said many people who come to him or to typically to people like vikram they already know broadly what the structure is going to be 
So they, so once a guy puts it together in the right order, they're going to, oh, that's it. That's what I was missing in my life. And mm. that's how they appreciate the service. So it's not as if they're going to, they're guaranteed of success or guaranteed of beating the market. That's not how it works. It's the structure. So they need to appreciate that first to, you know, appreciate the services of a planner. And uh, we also talked about the survey results last episode. And uh, so I showed uh, uh, in the last episode, couple of the slides and we talked about why the the wavelength matching is one of the biggest factors in yes. you know selecting an advisor so that's essentially what vikram is also saying exactly right so i'm and i'm also, leading towards that please. go ahead vikram Sorry. Uh, just to add to that so it's also the value when you when you i always have an introductory meeting with a client and i spend time on online just like this face to face before i even sign on a client and i'm very clear about what i do what i don't do uh, and that's very important because when you get into an engagement and then they realize this is not what they getting into that's where these unnecessary things come in so the whole point of having that introductory meeting is for that just to make sure we are on the same page and we are doing that and also the value that i as as patu said right this is not something you can look at the value at tomorrow morning and say you know i'm i'm okay i've got out of this but if i focus on giving that clarity and structure right that can be immediate that they have the peace of mind okay today night once i have my plan done i can go sleep well at night and that's the feel good that they have that is immediate but the results of you know what what does this plan do for you financially in the long run that's not something you can even uh, think about uh, many, many years, in fact. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. So I'm slowly leading up to this matching of styles, sorry. Uh, sure. What are the common mistakes you think investors make when they approach you? Um, approaching for the service you mean, if that's what you mean. Uh, yes. Yeah, not knowing who to go to for what, right? So for example, you go to an auditor for tax advice, you go to a, you know, maybe an insurance agent to get specific insurance advice, but uh, coming to a financial planner, it's more of a broader thing. But if you start, or you, you expect a portfolio manager's job from a financial planner, that's where the mismatches are, right? So you need to know who to, and they need to understand what are the different sectors in this field. And maybe you've covered this, I think, earlier too. Like a portfolio manager's job is not to care about your goals. It's about just focusing on taking your money, giving you a better return as much as possible for the risk uh, that you're taking, right? A financial planner is not about risk. It's not about uh, it's not, not about the products. It's more about giving the clarity and structure. So if you know who to go for what, I think you'll be in a better place. And that is where the financial plan has to be clear as to what is the real value that I'm adding here. I never use the word return anywhere in my presentation to clients or mm. anything for that specific reason. It's not about that at all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, those are some of the mistakes. But now a big part of what Pattu mentioned in the previous episode was, and the survey proved that, was matching of styles, which he's just mm -hmm. spoken. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe your style, Vikram? Sure. So I focus on the bigger picture, right, more than on products, right? Products are the last five or even 3% of what I even talk about. Uh, it's the journey that I try to go through that client for, you know, asking them questions that they may have not even thought about or pulling out goals that they should be thinking about that they've missed out. Um, so I focus on that bigger picture more. Um, secondly, it's also, I let the numbers talk. I, my style is not to, you know, tell you, okay, you can't do this or don't do this. Uh, I try to lay out the numbers and say, okay, this is what your numbers are. If you do this, this is the impact. And I give them the tool for them to even look at that. If you understand, okay, because of me spending 10% less on my vacation this year, I'm going to end up with two years of financial freedom earlier. Then it's up to them. And it comes from an internal space, right? That decision rather than me telling them, okay, no, you have to do this. They'll do it for a year and then they'll forget about it. So my style is more to make the numbers talk to them rather than me forcing anything. I lay out everything crystal clear and then help them. So that's my approach. And also, of course, I like to be, I always try to educate the client first before advising the client. I take three, four meetings with each client so that I can walk them through that whole journey of creating the plan. I believe in helping the client create their own plan rather than just taking numbers and creating a plan and say, this is your plan, go do it. So that is basically my style. But again, each person's uh, financial advisor styles are different. Some people find value in what I do. Some people don't like this. They just okay, I don't care about all this. Just take my numbers, give me my plan. I'll just go follow it. I, I personally mm. don't do that. I don't even encourage that because it's like as if I'm taking on ownership of their money and I hate doing that. I want them to be fully vested in what they really want to do. And uh, that's the different styles that you may find. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you find this interesting, Vikram, but I was telling Pattu on the earlier episodes also, when I speak to my friends, the common retort is, this is great, but I want somebody to do it for me. I want an enabler. So is that something you uh, even entertain? Uh, are you willing to do? Um, and how do you deal with such customers? 
Yeah. So when you say uh, you want to do it, right? See, it's what you do, right? So for example, if you want me to do the actual transaction for you and monitor your mutual funds every month and update you, that's something we don't do. And the portfolio manager or even an agent or someone is more is focused on that. Uh, I'm very clear about what I do and what I don't do also, right? So in that sense, yeah, uh, you will find people who want that. But if I don't do it, they don't even reach out. And, you know, so that that's uh, that's a thing. But yeah, that's uh, there will be always people who want different things, of course. Fair enough. All right. So and as we wrap up this first part of this amazing discussion, let me touch upon a very important topic in all our viewers and listeners' minds about pricing. How does this world of uh, fee-only RIAs work? How does the pricing work? Uh, is it an upfront free that you mentioned to your client? What are the different calculations, et cetera, et cetera? Please give us an insight into this entire important information that everyone needs. Sure. So, of course, every financial advisor is into business, right? He, he is in it to make money for himself sure. in the end. Otherwise, he wouldn't be in this. Um, so there are many ways, right? And probably you've already covered the broad things. But broadly, yeah, you can be either a commission person where you just focus more on just selling the product and earning a commission out of the product. Or you can be a fee-based planner where you actually give a plan, you charge for the plan and also earn commissions because you you want the advisor to, I mean, the uh, client to invest through you and also earn that commission. Fee only is the extreme case where, like myself and a few of us on the Fee Only India website, we are pure fee only, which means that we don't charge any, uh, we don't earn any commissions, we charge a pure fee. But even in this fee only, right, there are multiple models that you can come up with. For example, you can have a flat fee where it doesn't matter how much money or income a person has, you exactly pay the one fee. Uh, there are people who charge based on the time they spend or, or the workload that they're taking on. Uh, some people charge hourly, some people charge even on the assets under management. Uh, even in fee only, it's a flat fee, but it's based on a percentage of what amount you have. Um, so this, again, I think right or wrong, of course, I would have a strong opinion about that. That's why I am a fee-only financial planner who charges a flat fee. But there are other models. As long as there's no bias that comes in, I guess all models are fine. But it's also in how you provide that service, right? See, if you're giving importance to people who have higher amounts of money, then you are, of course, going to charge them more. Get I don't it, yeah. differentiate like that. My effort is exactly the same for everyone. Uh, in fact, see, adding another zero to a person's retirement calculator is not making my effort anymore, right? It's just another mm. zero on a calculator. So for me, in my process, in my uh, practice, I find no difference. Everybody takes those three, four meetings. Everybody goes through the same process. So I charge a flat fee. And this is all mentioned on the website. All the fee-only planners on the fee-only India website clearly state their fee on the website itself. So we're very, very clear on that. Yeah. Now, the flat fee... Uh in this flat fee component, and by the way, I want to break it down. Remember on our introductory chat, you said a very fascinating insight about, let's start with that, in fact, uh, Vikram, if you don't mind. You said there are sure. perhaps a thousand registered RIAs, right? And out of those yeah. thousand, you started cutting it down for me, which I found very interesting if you can just uh, talk about that. And how sure. you're down to a very, very exclusive small number. Yeah, I mean, servicing yeah. the the entire country, I just find that amazing. So for this, you need to understand the background of how this whole industry sure. was came up from there, right? See, uh, before 2013, right, there was no such thing as RIAs or anything like that. Most people were just salesmen, right? They were just financial advisors, but you had to invest. There was no direct plans, for example. You had to invest through somebody and they were earning the commissions and their business model was built around nothing but the more people who sign exactly, up with you and yeah. have assets under management, the more money you make, right? So the value that they show to client is not an actual financial plan. It's about showing how they're picking the best fund or, you know, mm. how fast they are with moving around funds or whatever. It could be anything like that. And they were all forced to become uh, RAs by SEBI, which is a good thing. But because they came from that mindset and that background, they were not able to suddenly pivot to completely fee only or, or from a I get financial it. I, planning. I would focus. struggle if yeah. I were in their place. Yeah. 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 So that's why you see most people who have that license up came from that legacy and they follow that same structure. And financial planning or building that plan becomes a secondary aspect for them. And the value they show is actually on the other side. Very few mm -hmm. of us are fee only or even fee based planners. Maybe started off like as Patu said, I came back, I had no background in India, I didn't work in any bank, I had no practice of, you know, selling products or anything. So I was able to build up this practice and show that clear value in financial planning. And then products are just ancillary. It's just the last point, right? So the approach itself is totally opposite. And because of this reason, 
after sebi came in there are very few people who started signing up for sebi itself and only the people who signed up on later are able to even come up from this otherwise they had to work with somebody and they went through that 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 mindset right so in today india yeah there are about a thousand i guess uh, ra is registered but majority of them are still somehow you know although they are not supposed to they still you know earn commissions or through ancillary uh, associations and all that but very few people who are fee based but even the fee based are trying to sell products and then fee only is just a handful as you as we may have seen about 20 25 30 of us uh, so that's the challenge and it, to to make the things to make things worse sebi has made it so difficult unfortunately for new entrants to come in and even a person exactly. i have so many people in this foi to you know support others and become get, get this um, uh, this tribe growing but they're not able to enter because of the regulations you need 5 years of experience and uh, net worth and all this kind of uh, you know this and it has to be full time yeah and has to be full time exactly so yeah. and that's the result the result of that is that it's just a handful of us in india who do this uh, advisory 20 and odd did you have an exact number yeah at, uh, if you go to the fee only india website there's literally about 23 i think right now as we speak uh, who are pure fee only there may be others who've not reached out to join us maybe but um, just a hand maybe you can count with your hand the other this is amazing this is fascinating you guys are a rare breed and in this modern day and age when you know you find so many people in every field this is amazing for me uh, but coming back to the fee when you say some people charge on an hourly basis are they fee only or fee based no fee only so you can be fee only but charge based on the time you're spending with the client but I mean, it's not a client to say hey i want to talk to you this month and next month the month after that yeah. uh, and so you say okay if you do want yeah. to like a lawyer i'll charge you on an hourly exactly, basis right exactly yeah. like a retainer kind of a thing right so the amount you time you spend i don't do that of course but there are people who may do that and my find find value some clients may want that but again i uh, most people in fee only are not like that yeah if Got i it. may so, so, sure, sorry but, if i may one of the reasons for vikram's success is that he has got one service hmm for one fee you you know the the usual marketing strategy with three panels they'll say best choice yeah. you know how the psychology of that that's th- those kind of gimmickry is not there it's just one fee for everybody and that is the one of the so the for the for the potential client it's so easy to understand right mm. they're not confused already they have enough confusions in their head they come to the advisor's website and then there are this advice this service that service what, they'll have problems what to choose Yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons he's so successful. And so to build on what Pattu said, even if a college kid comes to you today, or a newbie listening to our show comes to you today, or whether it's an Ambani who is taking our services, it's the same fee for everyone. Absolutely, it's the same fee, and almost the time I spend also is exactly the same. Because my whole point is, I even a person who has money, right? I just say forget everything, just come with a blank mind and sit down with me for the first meeting. I'm here to then sit down, talk to you about your goals, pull out your goals, then we talk about your cash flows, we capture your cash flows. That's the same process. It's just another another zero for a richer person. That's it, right? Mm-hmm. So my effort is literally almost the same for anybody, to be honest. Yeah. So before we end this episode, Vikram, just one final question, and Patu, you can jump in on this and with some final comments on this part one as well. in these 23 on the foi website do does everyone have a separate pricing and how does how do they decide their own pricing and is it public knowledge of how much each person charges but you Vikram? want to okay Vikram. yeah so yeah it it is public knowledge uh, we mandate that uh, every advisor who wants to be part of the fee only india website must have a very clear fee mentioned on the uh, website and it should they should not say that it's part of their uh, percentage of aum or etc it's a flat fee only then they're pa- they're part of foi but the uh, fee itself will change uh, in fact there is quite a big uh, difference in the range of fees so it i mean there's no real uh, what is the range part two can you state them it can i think if i think the lowest is something like 11000 or 12000 if i'm not wrong uh, going all the way to a lakh got it Okay, but but so it, it, it's not a smooth. I mean, it'll not go Fair all enough. the way. There's a yeah. big jump uh, right. towards the end. But typically, you will find uh, some something like fifteen thousand, twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand. Uh, many people would say that's a lot of money. Uh, the first instance is oh, that's a lot of money. Yeah, but it's not. It's it's probably the best investment that you can make. I I I was talking to uh, employees of the RBI yesterday, and I was making this very point and. their senior management people and i talked to them and there was this idea of fees and they suddenly you know their face changed when i said 20k 25k or something like that but they can easily afford it 
but they still had that uh, inertia that barrier to you know pay but i told them like this is the best investment that you can actually uh, you know make even for somebody who is a young earner who just you know started earning if you can shell out that money maybe a little lower you can hire somebody else if you want to uh, you know you know that's going to put you on the right path for life yeah and, and it's one time a year right this yes year. and from the next year typically the fees will drop to something Half. like 50% typically 50% so it's going to drop and uh, you know as you earn more and more and this fee is going to look smaller and smaller uh, over time so and you are going to build a relationship and the most important thing is even if you are somebody who understands personal finance very well it's possible that your spouse may not yeah but once you have these meetings together with the financial advisor in case uh you become sudden uh, become suddenly too busy you may need to go out somewhere you know uh, on an short term engagement or you become you got a new job or uh, for some uh, god forbid something happens to you you know your spouse can pick pick it up right uh, right there because the financial advisor knows who the spouse is what your equation is it's it's all taken care of so it's a smooth transition so it's the best investment that you can do on that note i think it's it's time for us to take a little bit of a break vikram patu thank you so much for your time there's so much coming up on the part 2 on next week all you viewers what the process is like uh, what vikram spends most of his time on um how he might inspire you to take this up as a career um and what is the true value that a sebi registered investment advisor a fee only ria such as vikram what is the value he brings to the table all of this on part 2 thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next week but to any last words vikram any last words no i've just said <laughs> i think we can yeah <laughs> look forward we'll to the next one. next one yeah bye bye see you bye bye